Now, uh, now Madison gets closer to the heart of the matter by saying, this assembly, speaking of Virginia, doth explicitly and peremptorily declare that it views the powers of the federal government as resulting from the compact to which the states are parties, as limited by the plain sense and intention of the instrument constituting that compact, as no further valid than they are, author than they are authorized by the grants enumerated in that compact and that in the case of a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact, the states who are parties thereto have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. This is really the phrase that is most cited out of the Virginia Resolutions that the states have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of the evil, the evil being the usurped power, the, us the usurpation of power, and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. Now, there's been much written on the differences between the Kentucky Resolutions of Jefferson and the Virginia Resolutions of Madison. There's much that, that uh, has been written to suggest that Madison is calling for a measure that is not as extreme as what Jefferson is calling for. Jefferson expressly calls for nullification, whereas with Madison we have simply the states are duty bound to interpose. He tends to use the term interposition to in effect stand between the federal government and their people. Okay, like Arthur Dent standing between the bulldozer and his home. Anybody recognize that reference? Okay, few Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Okay, so there are, some, there are some geeks in the room with me who recognize Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy references. That's good. Okay, uh, that's, now this is an interesting point. I mean, it needs to be dwelled upon. And I think some of this has to do with the fact that later, Madison's protests were so strong that, no, I never meant to imply that, that people have sort of taken him at his word. Well, I guess he never meant to imply that. Uh, a better explanation for Madison's later uh, second thoughts uh, comes from Albert Taylor Bledsoe, who wrote an important book about, the, about secession and the rights of secession after the war between the states. And Bledsoe said that uh, Madison seemed uh, more anxious in his later years in preserving the Union than in preserving the consistency of his own thoughts. So in later years, you know, he, he wants to try to hold the Union together, and anything that would tend to, to you know, have the states become more and more independent uh, minded, he wanted to discourage. But again, my friend Kevin Gutzman, who's written, I mean, he's been in the J Journal of the Early Republic, he's been in Journal of Southern History, I mean, all the major journals on this point. Uh, he points out that scholars who try to claim for Madison a much mo more moderate ground than the radical Jefferson are, are really on very shaky ground because, uh, for example, Jefferson had said that the states were the ultimate judges, both that a violation of the Constitution has occurred as well as the mode and measure of redress, how we address this violation. And some historians have denied that Madison took that view. Well, Gutzman says, if Madison really did not believe that the state was the ultimate judge of both the violation and the mode of redress, he certainly did not make that clear in either the resolutions themselves or the Publius letters. A careful reading of them does not leave the impression that Virginia would willingly have submitted to continued enforcement of the acts even in the event that no other state agreed with it. Again, uh, from another article of, of Gutzman, one of Madison's most notable tactical adjustments as, his, as the years had gone on had been his campaign as a retired former president to becloud the events of 1798 by denying they had meant what they plainly had meant. And then finally from his article in the Journal of the Early Republic, the distinction so often drawn between Jefferson's strident and Madison's moderate tone seems strained. There is no difference between null, void, and of no force or effect, and invalidity, between nullifying a statute, Jefferson's word, on the one hand, and interposing to prevent its enforcement on the other. I mean, in effect, these are the same, the same ideas. Now, here's a guy you've never heard of, most people, but that's okay because now we're going to resurrect this poor guy. Uh, I want to talk briefly in this connection of a, a figure who is totally forgotten, and yet he's a great constitutional and legal thinker named Abel Upshur, was a Virginian, a Virginia uh, a legal thinker who served brief terms as uh, Secretary, of, uh, Secretary of the Navy. 
in, uh, in the uh, early 1840s uh, and of secretary, as Secretary of State as well. Upshur wrote, uh, he wrote a pamphlet in 1833, and I'll get into a minute why, why 1833. This is 1798 after all. But he wrote a pamphlet in 1833 uh, an exposition of the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. It's one of these things that, you know, in the 19th century, when you write a pamphlet or you write a book, you know, the, the title is a paragraph long, so the title goes on the next three pages of the title of the thing, but just the exposition of the Virginia Resolutions of 1798. He's going to look specifically at the Virginia Resolutions of Madison and prove, even, even in the 19th century, prove that they did mean what Jefferson meant in the Kentucky Resolutions. Now, Upshur is a fascinating figure who's Whose, whose work needs to be collected into a, a volume. And I, I intended to do that at one point. I was going to, I have a bunch of his essays that are from obscure journals in, in my file cabinet. Uh, he had a great book that I'll be talking about probably in the second lecture today that was a word, that was a line by line refutation of Joseph Story's commentaries on the Constitution. Uh, Upshur wrote a, a, a book in 1840, a brief entry into the nature of our federal government, and it's it, it just takes story apart, and yet everybody's heard of story, whereas Upshur's book, you know, you've got you to go on bookfinder.com and shell out 275 bucks to get it, and it's, it's got to be brought back into print, and, but now I'm coming to think that I'm never going to have time to get to this. So if somebody wants to do this, I've got all the stuff, I can give it to you, you know, take it with my blessing, you know, better that you do it than that it collect dust in my, in my file cabinet. But what's interesting is that Upshur wrote a pamphlet pseudonymously under the name Locke, in 1833 on the Virginia Resolutions. It's never been reprinted. I have a copy of the original 1833 pamphlet. Uh, how on earth did I find that? I ripped it off from a museum. No, I made that up. That's just not true. I just, I just totally made that up. No, actually, one of the beautiful things about being at a university with a great, you know, a great library is the discoveries you make just standing around in the stacks. I mean, there's no, it's no substitute to use interlibrary loan to get books, because then you never find all the seven books around the one you want, and that some of them make the one you want look, look like, an, you know, like an idiot, you know? And that's, I, I, sorry, last night, la, last night I remember hearing Homer Simpson say that he has a backyard that makes his front yard look like an idiot. That's a funny <laughs> way of phrasing that, so it's stayed in my head. But in snooping around in the, in the stacks, I found there's a box of, of old pamphlets, and sure enough, there's this pamphlet by, by Upshur. It, of course, hasn't been touched in, uh, you know, in years and years. And so I probably wasn't supposed to photocopy it, because since that probably accelerated the decay. Um, so I really shouldn't be saying this publicly, but I did photocopy it. Because I figured, look, I'll preserve the thing. I'll get the thing published, for heaven's sake. We'll publish this thing. And then years later, I haven't done a darn thing on that front. But well, I'm going to share with you some things that Upshur said. I used to make this part of my, uh, my assignment in my uh, Foundations of American History course, where the paper assignment is I give you Upshur's work, Upshur's pamphlet, and then I give you some speeches by Daniel Webster, who takes the opposite view from Upshur, and then I want you to assess this, and what are they, what are they saying, and what is the crux of their disagreement? Uh, and there's a beautiful assignment, and anybody who uh, is looking for a, an American History assignment, it's a beautiful assignment because it's, it's totally non-plagiarizable. Because since this pamphlet hasn't been reprinted anywhere, no one's written anything on it. So they're going to look all over the internet for Upshur, and they're saying, oh, man, I can't find this anywhere. No, you can't. I made it that way. <laughs> all right, anyway, Upshur says this. He says, in these resolutions, Virginia Resolutions of 1798, the following propositions are distinctly affirmed. And he lists five propositions. That the Constitution of the United States is a compact between the states as such. That the government established by that compact possesses no power whatever except what the plain sense and intention of that compact gives to it. That every act done by that government, not plainly within the limits of its powers, is void. That each state has a right to say whether an act done by that government is plainly within the limits of its powers or not. And finally, that the states are not bound to submit to, but may resist, any act of that government which it shall so de decide to be beyond the limits of its powers. 